Welcome to the chapter overview of Political Parties, Chapter 6 in the online textbook, Chapter 7 in the book book. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to talk about political parties um, as part of linkage institutions. This unit is on political participation and one of the most important ways that people get involved in politics and government today is through linkage institutions, through channels that allow individuals to communicate preferences to policymakers, and so political parties are a really uh, fundamental and vital way uh, that people do this. We also see this through interest groups. Uh, you join outside groups, become a member or donate to that group. Uh, we see this through elections, uh, through campaigns that people donate to, uh, individuals that people donate to, uh, as well as to the media, paying attention to uh, social media as well as uh, the traditional media. Um, these are all linkage institutions. They are people or or um, platforms, channels that connect you with uh, politics and government in terms of uh, being able to exercise your internal efficacy. What we talked about before in the last unit, the idea of knowing and understanding how politics works and being able to apply it uh, to what's going on right now. So political parties are a very important part of that. Uh, what are political parties? Well, they're organizations and um, they are really focused on winning elections, okay? Uh, plain and simple, the most important thing they can do is win elections because if they don't win elections, they can't do any of these other things that are on this slide. Okay, you don't win elections, you don't gain power. You don't win elections, you can't influence public policy. You also can't unify the electorate, you can't organize government, you can't translate preferences into policy, um, you can't uh, link voters to politics and government in those ways. Uh, you really uh, are really limited if you're not winning. Okay, and that's why it's so important for parties to win. Uh, winning is everything uh, because it is, um, you can only be the loyal opposition for so long and then your party starts to to lose ground it's and we've seen political parties along the way even though we have a pr primarily dominant system of two-party government um, we know that those parties have changed over the course of, of history over the course of the United States and so um, they're not the same two parties that they were back in the uh, the days of Adams and Jefferson uh, but they have changed they've morphed over time in terms of uh, values and what they've held dear. And that is because uh, they have to win elections. If they don't, they cease to be relevant. And a third party uh, can take uh, take their um, their competition or take their voters and ultimately become uh, one of the two do major dominant parties. So uh, winning elections is really everything. Uh, everything else uh, comes after that. Everything else that you can do here comes after that, but it really is about winning elections. That is so important. Then you can organize the competition, this idea of how do we control government? How do we continue to win elections? Uh, we, we hear this often of, of establishing a permanent party. Uh, that's coming from uh, this idea of organizing the competition, as well as unifying the electorate around a message, around an agenda, a policy agenda uh, that's taking shape. Organizing the government as such, uh, the Biden administration doing that uh, with the uh, nominations uh, that they're, they've made and are making to um, uh, the, the government as a whole and, and uh, trying to carry out uh, their agenda in, in so doing. Um, translating what uh, they see as their agenda into policy. How do they do that? Uh, through the infrastructure bill, a great example of, of what they see as the policy agenda. How do we translate that into policy? We do it through legislation. Uh, we do it through um, uh, a panel looking at uh, the Supreme Court and whether um, it should be modified whether there should be any uh, action on that. Um, try, trying to work through those, uh, through those issues by uh, doing more research and, and, um, and looking at those policy preferences. Those are the types of things that we see there. Uh, if you're in the minority, it would, you would be the loyal opposition. Uh, you really have no power, especially in the House. Uh, in the Senate, at least, you have uh, the filibuster uh, where the minority is protected. But um, otherwise, um, in the House, uh, you are basically the loyal opposition, uh, and, and that is really the only role that you play in, um, in, in the House of Representatives, because you don't set the agenda, you don't control the timing, uh, you are basically there, uh, and you are scheduling member, your members uh, to be able to vote, but you're really trying to get back into the majority, and, and you can see that Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader in the uh, House uh, is uh, for the Republicans, is trying to do this, uh, talking about 2022 a lot, uh, 
also trying to raise a lot of money, uh, trying to um, uh, get a lot of support. So they're very much the loyal opposition over there uh, in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, uh, the the Senate Minority Leader, um, uh, right now Mitch McConnell, um, has a a 50 uh, person uh, delegation. So uh, is only a minority because of of the presidency being held by the uh, Biden Harris ticket. Um, Otherwise, um, that could very easily switch, and he knows that for 2022. So um, that is uh, so he's he's gearing up for elections and raising money and doing the same thing Kevin McCarthy's doing just on the Senate side. Some party functions, uh, as we kind of got into that there. What do they do? Well, again, if their most important mission is to win elections, they really need to um, do things that support winning those elections. That includes uh, m- mobilizing voters. Getting out the vote on election day, uh, making making sure people vote, uh, they vote early, uh, that they vote on election day, they get out the vote, educating those voters ahead of time, uh, reaching out and connecting with those voters, seeing that those voters see you uh, and, and see the candidates that you're running uh, so that they can vote for them. Uh, all of those are important to the party. And that's, uh, remember, those people in the middle, uh, those those independent voters and moderate voters are ones you want to win over here too. Uh, so um, using your party platform or different um, uh, your beliefs and what your policy agenda should be is really important here. Uh, recruiting candidates, uh, and that's what they're in the mode of doing right now, is uh, recruiting candidates for the primary that will be held next spring and in, in most states. And then really raising money, uh, really trying to develop their message uh, and, and doing that around it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi doing this uh, as speaker uh, and uh, Chuck Schumer as majority leader in the Senate. Um uh, both of them trying to raise money, mobilize voters, get out their message, really trying to govern at the same time they're also gearing up for uh, trying to get people to run in in um, places where they, they hope that they can win. Uh, and so this is so important uh, to the political parties because, again, winning is everything. Uh, you, you don't want to be in the minority at, after the election is over. Uh, it's a very hard position to be in uh, because you're basically, again, uh, sitting as the loyal opposition waiting for the next election in order to uh, to bring about change. So um, governing is very different um, in in terms of that role. You you are setting the agenda. You're setting the message. Um, you are um, bringing the legislation through committees and, and to the floor of the House and Senate chambers, really trying to get the, the message through there. So uh, that is a little different. When you're in power, you have a lot more uh, responsibility and a lot more authority to be able to drive that, which is really important here. But that really is um, what the uh, political parties are trying to do. And then, again, you're going to need money to do all of that. So fundraising is so important here. And then um, really trying to drive that uh, from uh, to and from your members, trying to help those members out with, with party funds, in addition to uh, them raising their own money um, and, uh, and their own campaigns. Uh, and um, John Boehner said this in his new book, that uh, political parties are less... Um, uh, less controlling of candidates today because candidates do so much of the fundraising on their own uh, due to the internet is really democratized primaries uh, and caucuses. So now um, a lot of people that uh, really would have found it harder to raise money within their party uh, can do it much more easily. AOC, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez here in the um, upper right-hand picture, uh, is a great example of this. Uh, she can raise a lot of money on her own. She doesn't need to rely on the party in order to raise money. And uh, so that's a significant difference uh, in terms of um, uh, how important the party is uh, and how closely you will you will stick with that party uh, versus your own beliefs and ideologies. And, and we're seeing that play out with her. She is much more... Uh, uh, liberal left uh, than than most members of her party, but she can do that one because she can raise a lot of money too because she's in a very safe district uh, that is very liberal uh, in Brooklyn, and so. Um, uh, she has that ability to be able to do that. Other candidates that are sitting in districts that are that are more swing districts, or they they can't raise as much money like she can, um, find it a little harder to do, and and that is uh, makes them more reliant on political parties, which is kind of the old system uh, that we've seen over over time. And speaking of over time, um, we've we've seen uh, that. Um, the party machines uh, that were held in caucuses, uh, those smoke-filled rooms where the party bosses basically told people how to vote, uh, that has changed. We don't we don't see as much of that anymore. Uh, we don't see as much of the, the fundraising internally within the party as we do with uh, some of the names and notables that we have out there. Uh, the internet has really, as I said, democratized 
uh, primaries and caucuses so that um, individuals can actually raise money and, and start email lists and, and, uh, and, and talk to people via social media uh, platforms in order to really get their message out and, and get their support from their voters. And so there's a lot more small donations that are coming in from a lot of candidates across the country and a lot of elected officials across the country because of the, um, the beauty of, of social media and the internet today in terms of raising that money. A significant game changer. But what that means is the parties don't have as much power over these individuals to be able to get them to vote a certain way, to be able to get them uh, to to help out other candidates and to and to um, move along the lines of of, uh, uh, of what the party would have them to do in terms of setting the policy agenda and carrying it out. Uh, and so that's very different. Uh, we've seen over time that parties. Um, have provided a lot of money and jobs, patronage over time, right? Uh, as well as other uh, other aspects of, of uh, political parties in power uh, that could do this, and um, and and we're seeing that diminished uh, as we've uh, as we've entered the internet era. That has changed. We've also seen the affiliation with political parties has changed, and so candidates like AOC and others, uh, if they're appealing, especially those swing voters, uh, the swing districts, when they're appealing to voters in the middle, those moderate independent voters, you really have to um, uh, you really have to set your own tone. You have to set your own message and your own policy agenda in terms of what you're trying to carry out uh, to keep and to to gain uh, a, a, and to add additional independent or moderate voters. That's really important here. And so as we see um, as we see the independents rise and the uh, political party affiliation fall, uh, that is is becoming ever more vital uh, for individual candidates to be able to do that. And as we as we've seen, changes in party ID over time uh, with downstairs rational choice are really just moving everybody to the middle. Um, we see those on the left and those on the right. Uh, you know, they are the base, and and they will continue to be there. That that twenty to twenty to twenty five percent of them. Uh, but the rest are one in the middle. It's those people swinging to the left and Democrats win, or swinging to the right and Republicans win. Uh, this is really uh, where elections are won and lost. Now, uh, let's talk for a second about uh, party ID because critical elections have happened in which there's been a significant shift, a change. And a good example of this uh, is from the Great Depression. 1932 was a critical election. We went from a Republican Congress and a Republican president to a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president uh, by wide margins. Um, that is a critical election. Uh, that is a significant change in terms of party power, going from a very hands-off approach to government uh, and um and business kind of doing its doing its thing uh, in 1928 to 1932. Uh, then, uh, with the election of FDR and a Democratic Congress, you have the New Deal. You have New Deal government programs. All of that very different than what was uh, being done the previous four years. All of that trying to get people back to work, trying to reduce unemployment, and and get people back to jobs, as we've talked about before. So that's a critical election. What we see in terms of party realignment uh, is this these what we call long lasting shifts uh, in. In terms of uh, not just one election, but multiple in terms of, of, of change. Uh, we saw this with um uh, the Civil Rights Bill uh, that was passed in 1964. Uh, Lyndon Johnson said, "The Democrats, the Democratic South, we have lost for for a generation." He was he was right, but he was wrong. Uh, they did lose them, uh, but they didn't lose them for just a generation. They lost them for three generations. Um, we've seen you know almost 60 years of um, of Republican Party rule uh, down in the South uh, because of of the Democrats' support for civil rights legislation back in the 1960s, uh, which also included the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So um, it was only in the uh, 2020 election with the uh, the changes in Georgia that we really are starting to see change in terms of, uh, and then uh, a change in terms of uh, shifting uh, back to a, a more positive climate for Democrats. Uh, and even that is, you know, remains to be seen with the changes in voter ID laws and uh, and voting laws in the uh, in in many of the states uh, that we've been talking about in class, uh, we'll see. You know what impact does that have? Is that going to be long lasting, or was that a blip uh, because of the pandemic, because of mail in voting? So to be continued, we'll see what happens there. But but it is uh, it is significant in terms of some of these realignments. I mentioned this uh, this uh, regional realignment, the Southern South, uh, that was taking shape there. 
uh, in the 1960s and and essentially um, and it took almost 60 years uh, to win back but uh, and and we don't know that they've, they've necessarily won them back yet but but the idea there is uh, that is significant change in terms of party ID and and we saw after the um, after the uh, Voting Rights Act passed in 64, that many Democrats uh, lost their seats, had trouble uh, hanging on to them, especially in the South, because of the votes that they had made uh, for civil rights legislation. legislation. And um, and that was a significant change, and, and we are just starting to see uh, those changes. Um, and we've seen blips along the way. Again, uh, those the, the idea there that we've had some um, wins in places, you know, there are, have been Democrats in Florida or in Louisiana, uh, for example. Uh, but any widespread change, we've not seen a shift from two Republicans to two, two uh, Democrats uh, like we did in Georgia in 2020. That was significant. Uh, we'll see uh, in, in 2022 and 2022. If and 2026, if that is long lasting, if that is a, a significant change. And that will tell us more about whether it really is uh, the beginning of a party realignment or a regional realignment here in terms of what we see there. But what are we seeing more than anything? We're seeing a de alignment. We're seeing more people become independent, more people being turned off by the parties, um, voting more for the individual uh, than voting for the party itself. Um, and um, and then seeing this, these people moving more towards the middle of Down's theory of rational choice, this idea of shifting to the left or shifting to the right in terms of how elections are won or lost. And this is important because it really is changing the, dynam the dynamic in terms of how people are um, running for office and trying to win over voters. Uh, you're not just appealing to the base. You're not just appealing to uh, those that are the party faithful. You've got to win over those voters in the middle. Uh, and we saw many of those voters um, in the middle that didn't like Hillary Clinton in 2016, and then in 2020 didn't like Donald Trump uh, out in uh, you know suburban America, uh, places uh, that we saw that changed hands, uh, places in Georgia, places in Wisconsin, places in Arizona, um, as just uh, as just three models uh, in terms of some significant changes there uh, that in just the right places uh, in Pennsylvania as well uh, that could that could uh, shift the. Um, uh, shift the the uh, the, the winner to uh, to another party, and that's uh, definitely what we saw in 2016. We saw it again in 2020. It shows you've got to appeal to the people in the middle um, because they are becoming a much greater voter voting block, um, and they're hard to figure out. Right? Uh, they are very kludgy in terms of uh, what they are. Um, what they're about and what they care about, and um, trying to appeal to those independents and those moderate voters is really where we're getting to this idea of candidate-centered politics. People are voting for individuals. They're voting uh, not based on party ID as much as they used to be, but they're voting for the candidates. And that's this is where the candidates take on lives uh, and caricatures and and um, and characters all their own. We saw this with Bernie Sanders. We saw this with Donald Trump. Uh, we have seen this time and again in these uh, these uh, houses and Senate races as well uh, in terms of very candidate-centered politics, which is a change um, because, again, uh, so much uh, of, of party politics over the last hundred years has really been focused on the parties, the party machine. Uh, we're moving away from caucuses. We're in primaries uh, where people can come in, vote, and leave, so they're not beholden to the party anymore. And that is really changing the game. And then people being more independent, uh, being able to um, uh, support candidates via the internet, uh, through small donations, all of this help, and the advent and the uh, the explosion of social media has really helped these uh, uh, candidate-centered type of, of campaigns to really take off. And uh, and I would say campaign finance laws have, have only underscored that. Um, as we've seen with, um, we'll talk more about this, the Citizens United case, where they basically, uh, the Supreme Court said um, uh, unions and uh, corporations, they're people too, and they have the right to free speech. And so uh, they get to spend what they want to. And outside groups, they can spend what they want to. And um, nonprofits that are primarily focused on research, but but have a political arm, they can spend whatever they want to. Um, and all of these um, outside groups unaffiliated with a campaign can spend all kinds of money. That's significant change uh, from 2010 to 2020. President Obama talks about this in his new book, uh, The Promised Land. Uh, and Boehner talked, uh, John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, his book just came out this past uh, week. And uh, he talks about it in his book about... Um, uh, so we've got a Republican and a Democrat both talking about how the changes in the uh, law based on the Supreme Court case of Citizens United uh, v. FEC 
uh, in 2010 really changed the game in terms of politics and especially on the national level. So these campaign finance laws really have changed uh, how candidates can collect money. Uh, they can collect money outside. We saw Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton in 2016 not yet announcing in 2015 that they were running uh, so that they could raise money for their um, uh, for their super PACs outside of their affiliated uh, candidates. Then once they announce that they're running, they have to make a clean break from those super PACs so they can't be affiliated. Uh, but who is left running those but people who were surrogates of those candidates uh, and, and, you know, carrying out their agenda and whatnot. So uh, essentially... Uh, running a de facto campaign outside of the campaign, and they can raise all kinds of money to the tune of, of uh, you know, almost $100 million being collected in some of these super PACs. Uh, and so that changes the game on a, on a national campaign. If you can re- collect over $100 million outside uh, the campaign and spend it, in addition to what you're collecting internally, um, that's significant, uh, significant change in terms of you don't need the political party uh, to run to run your show. You don't need as much from the political parties as you did before. And uh, Boehner and Obama really talk about this in their in their books about how this has really changed uh, the dynamic uh, in, in terms of how political parties are, um, are becoming less important uh, to candidates because of those candidate-centered campaigns that we see today. Now, you may remember uh, from first semester, we talked about the bureaucracy and the idea of the Pendleton Act, uh, this idea of civil service. Um, If you remember back in the days of Andrew Jackson, he basically brought in all kinds of people to work in government, to work in the bureaucracy, uh, because they were um, they were uh, the spoils. Uh, They were they were part of the spoils system. And he gave them jobs uh, if they, you know, helped out his campaign or whatever. And they didn't necessarily uh, have a lot of expertise or any expertise in some cases in the jobs they were they were filling. And so it led to um, a bureaucracy that that wasn't as responsive to the needs of the people. Uh, There was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, So this led to the Pendleton Act, ultimately, in the 19th century, uh, where we see uh, the civil service being created. And uh, the idea of ultimately taking a civil service exam um, uh, based on merit, uh, you get uh, ranked based on your GS level, and then uh, you can be slotted in there for a career. Uh, again, think bureaucratic theory of influence here, a career in government that, uh, that you can follow on a career track that is an actual path uh, for a, a solid career for you and uh, and and really promoted um, people within the bureaucracy uh, to to find a career a lifelong career here in the bureaucracy uh, and moving up the ranks uh, as you um, as you accumulate years in the system uh, so this really changed the game in terms of uh, how uh, those in the bureaucracy could participate in campaigns now the hatch act did change that and say hey um, you know, you can't run for Congress if you are in the executive branch, and likewise, you can't work in in the bureaucracy if you're in Congress. Uh, but also, uh, if you're in the bureaucracy, uh, you also can't run for office, and you can't. Um, uh, there are some political activities you can't participate in, uh, including obviously things on your uh, on your company time uh, while you're in the office. Um, but you know, outside of that, you want to. Uh, as an as John Q. Public, you know, as an average citizen, do you want to uh, you know hand out flyers to people and knock on doors uh, for candidates on your own behalf and not affiliated with the government uh, on a Saturday morning? You have the right to do that, and so uh, it did allow um, uh, members of the bureaucracy to be able to participate in in political activities without um, doing so uh, and trying to create a, a line of separation between their jobs and uh, their private life in terms of what they what they wanted to do to support so so employees are prohibited uh, from uh, soliciting or receiving political contributions as part of their jobs uh, but what they do on their own time is again uh, on their own time uh, in terms of what they can do there uh, you may also remember uh, we talked about some of this in terms of uh, elections when it came to Congress and and uh, the presidency uh, running for office uh, there are different types of ways that different states um, will nominate candidates for office uh, the the oldest one is the caucus system, and this is the idea uh, that um, people got in a, uh, you know, went w- in their precinct to a caucus, usually a gymnasium at a school, and uh, basically sat around uh, for a couple of hours and voted for for their for their candidate, and then found out who who won the 
the nominations for different offices and then went home. Um, then we went to a party convention system in which people kind of all came for a party caucus, same kind of thing. They voted and, and heard speeches and then left. Um, and so that was pretty popular for a while and and uh, and has been. There are some states that still do uh, their party conventions. And then uh, we get into the last hundred years or so where we've really seen direct primaries kind of take over. Uh, and this is the idea because of people's time and um, and uh, how busy people are, they can go in, they can vote, they can leave. They don't have to stick around. Uh, and it really does um, uh, take away from uh, the party bosses, the machines of the party uh, in terms of having influence and and uh, in elections and, and primaries in particular, uh, which really diminish the role of the political party uh, because people come in, they vote, they leave. They're really not um, affiliated with a party. They really don't feel any allegiances to the party. And that is significant in terms of the changes that we see with the democratizing of primaries today. With the internet, people can vote uh, with their dollars and 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 donate directly to candidates, to vote direct, vote with their dollars directly to candidates that are out there. And that's significant here because it really does cut the political party out of the process um, and allows candidates to collect more money, which is great, especially smaller donations because of campaign finance limits. But it also does uh, limit uh, the power of the political party uh, to have over uh, uh, their voters over their base um, in getting them out to vote, which makes it harder for uh, political parties to exercise influence uh, and, and to keep the party together, especially if you're in the majority and you have a really broad tent. Uh, it's really hard to, to keep the party in line. Uh, and that definitely is uh, what we see here. So the primary system definitely um, weakens the role of political parties because now it's not party bosses and party leaders that are doing this in, a, like I said, a smoke-filled room, uh, but it is um, it is people today uh, that are basically voting independently. And in some states where there's an open primary, you don't even have to be a member of the party to vote. Uh, you can go in and declare. In Virginia, for instance, uh, they have an open primary. Uh, and this is uh, this is the idea. An open primary is the idea that you, anybody can come in and vote. You, you select which ballot you want. Um, um, uh, Virginia has this, Ohio, Indiana, there's a number of states that have open primaries. Now, Maryland has a closed primary. You have to be a registered member of the political party. Now, you can change your registration up to uh, usually a month before the election or somewhere around there um, in order to change your voter registration. But you have to be a mem member of that political party uh, on the voter registration rules with the state, uh, with the uh, the county um uh, voting office in order to be able to uh, to vote in that primary. Now, in an open primary, that means that a Republican can go in and request a, de a Democratic ballot and can vote for the Democratic slate of candidates, uh, vote for the, the lesser of evils, if you will. Um, but in a closed primary, you have to be a member of the political party in order to do that. So it uh, reduces the number of outsiders that are coming in. Uh, New Hampshire it has an open primary. So we see a lot of people that will cross over. Uh, Democrats will vote for Republican candidates. Uh, uh, Republicans um, will vote for Democratic candidates, and um, and the reason for this is because uh, uh, they're trying to uh, either get bad candidates elected or to eliminate uh, ones that they they don't want to see on the ballot and may hurt them may hurt their party in November. Uh, and so again, this uh, diminishes the power that political parties have. And this was a, a really uh, great strategy used by the Trump campaign back in 2016 uh, when there were all those candidates that were he. Was was running against with at one point there were like 16 of them um and uh, he used this system to his advantage uh, because he had a lot of people that uh, came in and voted in an open primary for him uh, that weren't necessarily members of his party. And um, in addition to uh, getting Republican voters, he probably got a lot of Democratic and independent voters uh, that voted in an open primary for him. Uh, many of them thought that he would lose to Hillary Clinton, uh, so they voted for him to get him on the ballot for that purpose. Uh, and lo and behold, he ended up, he ended up winning uh, in, in some of those key places that we've talked about. Now, the top two system uh, is new, and this is coming up uh, with uh, with another uh, type of voting uh, that's called rank choice. Uh, but top two is basically uh, whoever gets the top two votes in a primary uh, advances to the general election. Now, uh, in, a, in a state like California, um, where you uh, have over overwhelmingly Democratic support, uh, the top two uh, are going to be Democrats. So it's got one Democrat running against another Democrat, and the Republicans are, are kind of uh, out of the, uh, the party at that point. But the reason is to keep a, a general election competitive. 
And so that's why uh, they do that. But again, um, for Republicans, that diminishes uh, the power of the party because you're not even you're not even able to show up for the general election uh, because you're already cut out of that system. So that's really important in terms of uh, how it kind of frames or or uh, really diminishes the effect that political parties have here on on what is happening. Sorry for the uh, the, the slide mix up here, but the idea uh, that we see here is uh, these are um, states in which we see closed and open primaries, um, as well as caucuses. You can see the old some of the older states like Nevada uh, and um, and the caucus system uh, that we see at work here. Uh, but um, we can see that that the primaries, uh, either closed or open, are are kind of taking over, and that really is diminishing the power of political parties in terms of what's taking shape here. We saw this with the um, uh, with the 2016 campaign, Sanders versus Clinton. Uh, we could see that Sanders won um, a lot of caucuses. Uh, Clinton won a lot of uh, uh, primaries uh, in terms of what was going on there. Uh, even with uh, Trump and Cruz, uh, we could see um, Trump winning um, uh, some some uh, winning winning in the primaries because people are less uh, have to be less devoted in that. Uh, and uh, and Cruz winning more of the caucuses where people have to to stick around. So uh, pretty significant in terms of uh, in terms of what we see there. Now this was the uh, the 2016 uh, sorry the 2020 um, uh, campaign on Super Tuesday, which uh, we would have we would have been done with this point last year. Uh, but it really does show uh, how front loading really uh, front loading the idea of putting your state up front uh, so you have a chance to be a part of the process because by the time you get to April or May, uh, I remember with um uh, with Maryland's uh, primary happening in April, uh, the the election was pretty much over. We we had a candidate, uh, Joe Biden, uh, and 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 Donald Trump were basically the candidates uh, in 2020 for the general election. Uh, so by the time they got to the the primary here in Maryland, it was a foregone conclusion. Uh, it was pretty much over uh, in, in terms of who the candidates were going to be. That's why uh, states like to front load. They like to move their uh, their caucus or primary up as as far as they can in order to try and um, uh, have some influence and impact. Uh, otherwise, how many how many candidates do you know that, that actually showed up in Maryland? Uh, uh, maybe if they were raising money or something, but that would be about it. Otherwise, they didn't show up here because uh, they knew it was going to be a foregone conclusion by the time uh, they reached the uh, the state of Maryland. Uh, some party conventions. Uh, this is where we like to, to um, spend... A lot of time, but party conventions are really um, where you uh, rev up the base and you basically inform the independent voter. Uh, because these are televised, uh, all of the the televised uh, portions, usually two hours uh, for four nights, uh, Monday through Thursday, or on television, and so um, that is really the the dog and pony show of the of the party that you see on TV. And again, uh, people watch them not as many as used to watch them, uh, but there's a lot uh, a lot more glitz and glamour to those in terms of the seeing and be seen kind of thing. Uh, but again, uh, as people move away from political parties, um, are these having as much influence? Probably not, or not nearly as much as as we've seen in the past. Um, they are glitz and glamour, as I mentioned. So you see the balloon drop. You see the nominating convention, which is kind of cool. You see the uh, development and adoption of the uh, platform, the, pol the, uh, uh, the, the policy agenda, the, the party platform, if you will, uh, that has planks in it. Uh, think of a platform like a, a deck on your, on, you know, a deck over your backyard. Uh, it's made up of planks. Those planks are individual things that, that your party supports. Um, and, and that is uh, really what uh, the convention is all about. And then to rev up the, uh, the audience in terms uh, the base, particularly, uh, to help them get more people out to vote, but also to um, to uh, introduce your candidate to the independents and moderates that are out there watching on television. So very important, a party convention in terms of getting your message out. Um, and um, uh, But again, um, these are very scripted events, very televised uh, opportunities uh, to get in front of voters. Um, how does the process work in terms of party structure? Uh, there is the national convention, as I mentioned, is kind of that party platform, introducing your your candidates for your party, and then any rules changes for uh, the upcoming, uh, the the next four year convention uh, that you see there, the the adoption or, or the election.
election of the uh, National Committee, which is going to run the party in between those conventions. And then it's really about raising money. Remember, political parties are all about winning elections. You don't win, it's really hard to raise money. You don't win, it's really hard to set the agenda and, again, appeal to people for more money. So what we see here are different campaign committees. Uh, you see the... Um, uh, National Republican Senatorial Committee, uh, the Democratic Senate uh, uh, Campaign Committee, National Republican Campaign Committee, Democratic Central Campaign Committee, they're all about raising dollars, okay? Uh, they're all about raising dollars and in order to, to raise money because uh, without money, political parties don't get their message out there. And if they're uh, not winning, they're, they're finding it harder and harder in order to, uh, to get, those dollars, uh, get those dollars in to help their candidates. Um, do primaries exist only for the president? presidency. What do you think about that? Um, uh, as we've seen here, uh, we have a lot more than just a presidency that's at work. We have 435 members of the House that are up every two years. Um, that's important, uh, being primaried uh, by a candidate that's further to the left or further to the right of your views uh, is a, a scary situation for you if you're uh, in elective office and you're being primaried by someone who's further to the left or further to the right of your own party. That's scary, uh, but, but primaries exist uh, for those members of the House and members of the Senate, as well as gu uh, gubernatorial races, governor's races in the states, and state houses have uh, the House of Delegates will be up in, in Annapolis in 2022. Uh, the governor of Maryland will be up uh, for election in 2022. We'll see um, uh, Senate seats in the Maryland Senate up in 2022, so a very big race for a midterm. Um, so primaries exist for those offices as well, so it is much larger than that. Now, in the Democratic Party, uh, we also see superdelegates, uh, which will show up at these conventions. This has kind of changed a little bit uh, since the 2016 election. Uh, in, but, they, but the superdelegates are alive and well. And these are really party activists, celebrities, other people who come to a convention uh, really for the name recognition, a former governor, a former senator, um, a, um, uh, a, a, a celebrity that, that, that uh, you know, it, that uh, is from your state or lives in your state. Um, we see a lot of those uh, that will show up. So uh, we've seen Arnold Schwarzenegger um, show up for the Republican convention. Uh, we've seen seen um, uh, J-Lo show up for the uh, Democratic convention. Uh, so there's, there's a number of, uh, of people that uh, you can, you can uh, see as superdelegates, but we also see former governors, uh, former presidents uh, that'll show up as superdelegates. Bill Clinton was a superdelegate in 2016 uh, from New York uh, for um, nominating, and, and he uh, uh, nominated from the state of New York uh, Hillary Clinton to be the nominee. Uh, so um, they don't necessarily pledge to any state, as far as a superdelegate goes, uh, there are over uh, 700 of them. Uh, but the idea is that they can be easily swayed and they can uh, sway the, uh, the total impact. Uh, Bernie Sanders did really well with um, a lot of caucus goers, as I mentioned, and so uh, really racked up the points. And Hillary did really well in 2016 with the superdelegates, uh, really the superdelegates in terms of, of driving that. And, um, and so uh, they can swing an election in terms of who the nominee is uh, just based on the number of superdelegates that are there. And, and that has been revised to try and uh, make it more even Stephen in terms of caucuses, primaries, and the role of superdelegates. Uh, but superdelegates are still alive and well. They are still within that system. Um, what we do see is uh, over time, again, uh, you're, you're trying to uh, identify the base, trying to get uh, party activists and volunteers involved in um, uh, your campaigns, in your elections, in the national, in the, uh, in the parties, uh, in order to try and win elections at the local and state level, uh, but then also driving that up uh, to the national level in terms of this um, this four-year national convention uh, to um, nominate a, a candidate for president. So there's a lot of other pieces that go into this, not just uh, what we see on television in terms of the, uh, the presidential race. Um, now, why do we have a two-party system? Well, um, I, I, I always drive this home that, uh, that the Constitution it plays a very significant role, and it definitely does. But a lot of this is also because of tradition and elections uh, and election policies, um, uh, not just the Constitution in terms of what's happening here. But, uh, but you do have to look at the, the Constitution in terms of, well, how, do, how are elections formed and framed? Well, election policies, a lot of those are derived from Article 1 and Article 2 of the Constitution uh, in terms of driving that. But there's a lot 
lot more at stake here in terms of why we have that two-party system. Uh, remember, there's nothing in the Constitution that talks about political parties, uh, but how elections are set up does matter. Uh, and when we have a system in which one, uh, the, the, the uh, essentially the, the winner take all, the, the person who uh, in a single member district wins the most votes in that district wins the seat, um, it really makes it hard for somebody in a third party to ever win. Uh, because even if you're in a swing district uh, and you have two parties, uh, if the voters are swinging w one way uh, v or the other, you have Democrats win or Republicans win, there's not a whole lot of room for a third party there to win. Uh, and so the third party never wins because of that single member district system. Uh, and because of that winner take all, um, it makes it hard uh, for um, anybody, any other party to take shape. Now, I didn't say impossible, uh, because as we know, parties do change over time. But why is it uh, that, that there are two parties? Uh, because of, of, of the election laws, we, we vote for individuals, and uh, we vote for those political parties uh, that um, the, the members that are part of those political parties, and uh, those don't tend to change. And so when you have... Um, uh, when you have a Democrat win and then a Republican win and then a Democrat win again, there's no room for a third party to really get a critical mass, to really get a foothold uh, and actually win votes in, in most places that have those single member districts. And you also have to remember, who's gerrymandering these districts? Well, it's state legislatures that are made up of Democrats and Republicans. So uh, election policies and election laws that are created, including gerrymandering and the redistricting process that happens in states every 10 years, we're about to get one here uh, very shortly uh, with the uh, census data coming out, but uh, these lend itself to that two-party system. And that leads to domination in the process because of those single-member districts. If you don't win, the other party's going to, and, and hopefully you'll win next time. And so it's this back and forth. There's no proportional representation. Other legislatures uh, in other countries, uh, some of them have proportional representation, which means if you win 10% of the seats, 10% of the vote, excuse me, uh, you get 10% of the seats uh, in that in that uh, legislative body. We don't have that in Congress. It's a single member district, um, and that is uh, set up um, in in order to. Um, in order to, to have one person that wins the majority of the votes in that district and you win that seat. Uh, and so there's no proportional representation. So with that, uh, a third party that's winning 10% of, uh, of the vote every time is only going to get 10% of nothing uh, because they're never going to get anything uh, because they're not winning that district. And as long as they continue to lose, uh, they will continue to lose support. So we've seen third parties along the way that have really come up um, uh, we've seen the Reform Party, and we've seen the, the Libertarian Party, and we've seen um, other parties along the way that have really tried to gain support, but maybe in an election or two, um, and then they start to fizzle out. It's harder to raise money when you continue to lose. It's hard to get good candidates when you continue to lose. Uh, so uh, that has led itself to the two-party dominant system that we see today. And with that winner-take-all, um, again, uh, what do you win if you come in in second place? Well, nothing. But if you're a part of a major party, you can at least um, uh, keep enough money and momentum to live another day in order to, in, in, uh, in, that, in that sense, to be able to run another election and hopefully win next time. And um, that's the winner-take-all system. What we see here is the plurality uh, elections. Uh, you don't necessarily need a majority either. Uh, you only need more votes than everybody else, uh, any other candidate. So uh, you could have a situation in which if there's you know five parties running and uh, you win the most votes, but it's only like 35% of the vote, you still win the seat. And what does the, um, uh, the third, fourth, and fifth party places win? They win nothing again. Uh, so uh, in a majority system, you need runoff elections. We see this um, in a lot of southern states, uh, the runoff elections, if you don't win a majority of the vote, uh, you have to go in a runoff with the top two, um, and that um, uh, tends to um, lead to this two-party domination again because uh, those 
that um, if you're running in a runoff election, uh, you're basically getting rid of all of the other um, all of the other parties, and now you're focusing on on just the top two parties. You can have an advantage if you have more voters registered by for your party in that in that district or in that state um, in order to run that. So that's uh, significant here. But again, it underscores the two party dominant system that we continue to see. So why do we have minor parties then? If we're talking about the fact that we're a two party system and it's not changing and hasn't changed and it continues to be a two party system, why are minor, minor parties still around? Well, I'll tell you because uh, they have a lot of great ideas. Ideas that are then uh, quote unquote stolen, if you will, let's say borrowed, uh, borrowed, if you will, uh, by the two major parties. They take them on as their own. And those ideas, uh, the issues that, that come about from these third parties end up getting adopted by the, the two major parties in some way, shape or form. And it becomes a part of their policy agenda. It becomes a part of their party platform. Um, and so what's the best way to get your message out if there's an issue you really want to raise? start a minor party, uh, get enough uh, groundswell of support around it, you might get somebody to take up that issue. You're probably not going to win uh, in that regard, but uh, you know, in, in that sense, I don't think Ralph Nader was expecting to win against uh, Al Gore. I think Ralph Nader you know, ran the campaign uh, with the intention to win, uh, but uh, he knew that, that uh, it's a two-party system and Ross Perot the same. But if you can have an impact and you can get the issues out there uh, so that um, so that the um, the candidates will take up and adopt your issues, then um, then it may be worth all that's going on in terms of making that happen. Now we mentioned realigning elections. I wanted to go. Um, uh, there's a little more detail here, and you can pause and and, and read it. But we mentioned 1932 as being a real realigning uh, election in terms of uh, major change, major lasting change in terms of of differences here. We saw this in 1896. We saw it again in 1860 uh, with the um, the election of Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans uh, in in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of secession and slavery, the vote on slavery. Um, and um, these are realigning, a major shift in uh, how voters are voting from one party to another. These are realigning elections. Um, this is a major difference in terms of what we see here. Now, uh, the question is, um, is 1980 a realigning election? Well, it could have been. Uh, it could have been. Uh, but um, while uh, there was dissatisfaction with Carter, um, Ronald Reagan did win, and, and he won significantly. You can see by how much there. Um, he, he definitely won uh, quite a few, uh, I guess you could classify this landslide, definitely, uh, in terms of uh, in sweeping across the country. Uh, but uh, Congress was still Democratic. Uh, Congress was did not change to be Republican either, and so that's why it's not considered a realigning election. Um, and um, and we continue to see uh, Congress win re-election uh, uh, as as a democratic institution, a uh, democratic majority. Uh, so in 1982, Democrats uh, continued in Congress. 1984, 1986, there are some changes happening, uh, but uh, but the idea is. Um, we still see uh, a Democratic Congress and a Republican president. So that's why we don't uh, really see that as a realigning election per se. All right, so a little bit of review here. I'm not going to go through all of the details, and you can uh, pause these to go through it if, if it will help. Uh, but remember the solid South I talked about before, the idea here um, – that um, because uh, you you had uh, the votes for the Civil Rights Act um, uh, among Democratic uh, uh, elected officials, a lot of them lost their seats and would never regain them, and many of them have never regained them uh, in in terms of um, uh, places like Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, um, that had significant change and and uh, and it has continued to stay solidly Republican. Uh, this leads to what we call divided government uh, when you have um, um, you have divided government in terms of uh, a, a party uh, running the White House that is of one party, uh, a Republican, and then you have Congress that is Democratic or of, an, of the other party. Uh, so that is a divided government. And again, it's very hard to get things done. You got to compromise. You got to work together. Uh, you got to find common ground in order to work things out.
Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, President Biden is looking to uh, a, a very evenly split Senate uh, in terms of his infrastructure package. Is he going to uh, find compromise and, and workable solutions with the Republicans? Um, but again, um, Republicans are also focused on 2022. Is it in their best interest to compromise uh, and, uh, and find common ground in order to work with the, uh, the president on this, who knows? We will see. We will see how that plays out. Uh, but parties um, are important in Congress uh, because obviously the way they are organized uh, is very much uh, by party. Uh, and so we see uh, those that, that sit on the uh, left would be Democrats. Those that sit on the right would be Republicans. And um, uh, when you think about who's in charge, the Rules Committee is, is set up and, and nominated by the House Speaker. Um, and so committee chairs, uh, essentially chosen by the Speaker, um, uh, who is the, the, the person in the majority, uh, in the majority party. And, um, and so how they sit, how they're organized, how they, they do their committee work, all of this being done by party. So we can still see the importance of governing uh, is really critical here by party. Now, that doesn't mean they're all under uh, in line and in sync with the, the broad tent. Uh, and I use the example of uh, West Virginia uh, Senator Joe Manchin uh, versus uh, a Democrat uh, and in, in the Senate. And then we have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, on the liberal left as a Democrat in the House. Very different points of view, very different approaches to their, their uh, party's messaging and the agenda that they see there. Uh, but that is uh, significant in terms of how are they organized, uh, for now at least, uh, and, and, uh, and have been for, for a very long time, uh, they are organized by parties. Um, some other things that parties do as part of this, obviously strategy is important here, the policy agenda, working with the president if they're the party in power. Um, uh, many cabinet officers we've seen appointed by President Biden have come from Congress, um, and uh, Congress, in, especially in the House, being so evenly split, uh, the, the uh, Democrats, I think, outnumber the, the Republicans. The latest tally was, I think, four or five. Um, so you really can't lose a lot of votes uh, and, still, uh, and, and still get your legislation through. So that's really important. Uh, federal judges, uh, organization of the courts. Uh, we've started to see uh, President Biden nominate judges uh, to the circuits, uh, to the federal circuits, uh, the uh, the tier beneath the Supreme Court uh, in terms of some of those offices, district, uh, federal district courts and, and circuit courts, um, uh, and uh, and how that is organized. Again, political parties are the ones uh, that are um, supporting the president in those nominations. And then uh, we may think of them as labels, uh, to and, and voters definitely do, uh, but a lot of this is informational. Um, people are looking for information in terms of uh, the role that uh, political parties play and how they play it, how they have significant uh, impact in getting out the vote with voters and mobilizing voters, uh, in, and especially in uh, places where they are swing districts, uh, every dollar counts. And if you can uh, get money from your political party and get their support uh, and, and uh, especially uh, get their base out to vote, uh, that may make the difference um, in terms of your, your efforts to win over independents and moderates. That may make the difference in terms of uh, an election won or lost. Now, we talked about this before, the idea of a decline in party ID. This is more of an FRQ we're going to do in class, uh, but is also a good practice in terms of that identify, define, and explain uh, in terms of what's happening here. But again, we're continuing to see more people moving to the middle. Downstairs of rational choice at work here in terms of that uh, de-alignment that we talked about before. Realignment, uh, significant uh, change in political parties um, and that is lasting. Uh, de-alignment, more people moving to the middle, more people moving uh, to a a rejection of the parties and really a focus on on winning um, uh, on voting for the, uh, the the person, not the party. Uh, focus on the individual who's running for office and less so on um, on the party that they represent or the party that they're they're being backed by. Um, we have seen some campaign finance changes, and we'll talk more about this in the next chapter. Uh, but. Um, Political parties have spent a lot of money, and they've raised a lot of money over the years. Um, and uh, after the uh, Watergate scandal, uh, dealing with uh, campaigns and elections, um, 
the Congress passed uh, FECA, the Federal Election Campaign Act, uh, in 1974 that limited uh, how much money could be collected by candidates and campaigns. Uh, in 1976, Buckley v. Vallejo, the Supreme Court case, actually said, if you're a millionaire and you want to spend your money on your own campaign, even if it means you're flushing it down the toilet, go ahead. You can do so, as long as it's your money or your spouse's money. Um, you can't give it to your kids or anything like that. Uh, but if it's your money, uh, you can spend it however you wish. And then in 2002, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, or the McCain-Feingold Act, basically said uh, we're going to ban um, all soft money contributions. Uh, we're going to ban uh, party building activities, and and unions and corporations can't spend that money there either. Now that would that part would be overturned by Citizens United in 2010. Um, but uh, they also said uh, even though you can't raise this money, you can't collect this money, uh, you can create an issue ad. Um, uh, different groups can create issues ads and parties can too outside of of the campaign um, as long as uh, you are um, as long as uh, you you are doing it uh, as an issue ad not as a campaign ad supporting necessarily uh, the individual that the ad is is about for or against um, and so this gave rise uh, to the whole idea of uh, of issues advocacy and the um, uh, the importance here of those uh, types of issues ads, which we would see uh, if you um, if you uh, do a search on YouTube uh, for the um, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, uh, one of the most famous uh, issue ads uh, was a um, an ad for George W. Bush against John Kerry. Uh, it was from Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, and it basically um, talked about Kerry's record, uh, really uh, criticized him. Never in the ad did it say vote for George W. Bush. Never in the ad did it say uh, they were supporting George W. Bush, but it really cast a lot of doubt on on uh, John Kerry, and it, it hurt him quite badly with independent and moderate voters as a result of that, what we call a 527, uh, that 527 or issue ad uh, that was um, uh, that was uh, uh, put out by them. And they did so uh, without really um, having to tell anybody uh, what kind of money was being raised or by whom, uh, which really gave rise to what we call dark money. Uh, and again, we'll talk more about that in the next chapter. But dark money, pretty significant here because we don't know who's raising it and and uh, and, and they do have to report it eventually. Um, but in some of these groups, they actually don't. Uh, they don't have to report it. And so uh, we may never know uh, where the money is coming from. Uh, but soft money the idea of raising uh, additional money from people and not having to report where it's coming from. Um, you could raise unlimited amounts uh, back before the BCRA. You couldn't do that after BCRA now um, in that soft money, but you could do it outside. Outside groups could do it, and that's what really gave rise to all of the money we see outside political parties today. It basically... Um, uh, really started to kill the political party uh, because it uh, gave rise to these outside groups that could raise all kinds of cash, all kinds of money, uh, and to be able to do so outside of a political party. Uh, and uh, so they actually would have as much, if not more, uh, political clout and influence in a campaign than a political party would. And that really changed the game. Uh, hard money, the, the what I call cold hard cash, hard money, if grandma writes a check, uh, that is hard money. It is... It is money that is limited. She can only write a check for $2,800 per election cycle, per campaign. Um, and, but um, she, uh, they, they, the campaign does have to report that money. So it has to be under $2,800 per campaign. So she can donate $2,800 in the primary. She can donate $2,800 in the general election. So you can collect $5,600, $600 from grandma. Um, but all that money has to be reported. They have to follow the money. Outside groups, grandma can write a $50,000 check to an outside group, uh, uh, one of those 527s, or more importantly, what we see today, uh, the 501c4s or the super PACs uh, that can collect unlimited amounts of cash uh, from outside groups. And uh, many of them, uh, skipping reporting deadlines, don't have to report it as as uh, as uh, rigidly as, as the political parties do. Uh, so what do parties spend their money on? Obviously, uh, candidates uh, winning elections. Because again, if you're not winning elections, uh, you're not 
the party in power and and uh, and then you're in the wilderness you don't want to be that uh, independent expenditures the idea uh, is now unlimited for parties uh, they can collect all kinds of cash and they do but it also gave rise to all these other groups that, that I mentioned that are able to raise all kinds of cash and they do uh, and they're really competing against political parties uh, for this money and influence in terms of, of what they see there so uh, it really gives rise to this idea that political parties may be dying uh, in terms or at least changing in terms of um, uh, in terms of the party and its influence um, the, uh, the the parties really can't take contrasting positions anymore because uh, under a broad tent you have lots of different people and you need to be able to um, appeal to the the Joe Mansions uh, the voters of Joe Mansion as well as the voters of Alexandra Ocasio Cortez um, which means um, it's a very broad tent, very broad in terms of uh, the focus there. And so uh, being a member of the party really doesn't mean anything anymore. You can be a member of a super PAC, uh, and it means probably just as little as it does being a member of a political party. So um, again, the the parties are, are focused on winning, uh, but uh, we're seeing a lot uh, more independent voters uh, that are splitting their ticket, uh, which means they're voting for Democrats and Republicans or other candidates. Um, the, the parties are really trying to align to those voters in the middle, uh, which is where candidates are, and that really makes it hard for political parties. Uh, they can't be in the corner of their candidate anymore. There, there is no corner, uh, and that is uh, really significant. And again, as we said, with third parties, uh, why the deck is stacked against them, the system promotes two parties, uh, the idea of single member districts, uh, you win the most votes, you win the seat, uh, you win 10% of the votes, you win no seats ever. Uh, and so um, that is very different in terms of uh, the approach that, that's taken there. Um, plurality system would be, um, a, you know, the... Um, uh, what we have, the idea, if you win the most votes, you win. Uh, even if you don't win, the majority um, win 50% or more. Uh, and so uh, that leads to this idea of winner take all. You win the most um, uh, votes in that district, you win that district. And district by district, uh, people can win. And that's what creates that two-party system that we see today, uh, which means proportional representation is out. Uh, it is not a part of our system. Other countries have it. We do not. Um, and we have the single-member district system. System, and that is one person is elected for each district that we see across the country, all 435 districts elected by uh, by the voters in each of those districts. Okay, and that's what we see there. Uh, ballot requirements change uh, based on state. Um, the voter ID laws, as we can see, and we've been talking about change by state, um, as well as uh, who gets on the ballot who gets enough signatures, um, how does all of that work, uh, and, and those continue to change in terms of, of how that is uh, taking shape within the political party. Each state is legislating those voter rules and those voter eligibility requirements in terms of what we see there. But we know the Electoral College um, is all about whoever wins the most votes wins the electors for that state, other than Nebraska and, uh, and uh, Maine. Nebraska and Maine are the only exceptions to that rule. Otherwise, it is winner take all in those states. And that is what, again, underscores uh, the, the lack of support for a third party uh, candidate uh, or a third party in general. Uh, so as political parties are diminishing, uh, what are we seeing? Well, there's less importance of that third political party. So uh, maybe you want to run in a much broader primary in one of the two major parties uh, and get your message across that way. Um, but uh, but third parties are still vital for the issues that they, they raise. Uh, the um, the issues that they bring to the table and, and how they really address uh, issues that then the, the two major parties, many cases, uh, will adopt and take on. Um, there are some additional questions here for review if you want to pause the video and check those out. Uh, I've got some of those here. And uh, that wraps up this chapter. Uh, believe it or not, that is political parties in a nutshell. I hope you found this helpful and uh, good luck. We'll see you in the next chapter on campaigns and elections.